Hello, welcome back to the show. I'm Aaron Wren, and very excited today to have a special guest, Brad Wilcox. Brad, thanks for joining. Good to be here, Aaron. Brad Wilcox is a professor of sociology at the University of Virginia. He's a senior fellow at the Institute for Family Studies and has some other affiliations. Uh, for anything you want to promote that we leave out, um, mm -hmm. you know, you've got so much going on, it's hard to get it all in, uh, but, but we'll put it in there. Uh, he's written several books. His most recent book, I believe, is called Soulmates, Religion, Sex, Love, and Marriage Among African Americans and Latinos. Uh, so you might want to check that one out. And we're here today to talk about marriage because Brad is one of the leading academic experts in the country on the subject of marriage. So if anybody has any questions about it, mm -hmm. uh, you know, from, a, from kind of a sociological perspective, just please uh, drop them in the comments. So Brad, again, thanks for joining. And I guess the, the, the thing I like to lead off with is just a question about something we see a lot in the news, which is this idea that we're seeing a decline in the marriage rate in America. And is it true that we're actually seeing a decline in in the marriage rate or are we just people just getting married later and that's making it look off? Yeah, Aaron, good question. We're seeing both a an increase in the number well, sorry, in the age of first marriage to around 30 uh, in the United States and we're also seeing a decline in the number of Americans, the share of what's the share of Americans who will ever marry. Uh, so it's, you know, it's it's a both and story there. And this has kind of been playing out since the 1970s, you know, this increase in age at first marriage and this decline in the in the overall share of Americans who will get married. And I think, you know, certainly I think on the bad news side of the ledger, uh, the bad news here, I think, is that probably more than one third of young adults today, say folks in their early 20s, uh, will never marry. And that probably will wow. put us in their kind of record territory for the U.S. And it's uh, coupled with, pun intended, um, coupled with a, you know, a pretty dramatic decline in fertility. And uh, my colleague Lyman Stone estimates that about 25% of young adults today will never have children, which will probably also kind of put us into record territory. So we're kind of, we're seeing in part of our culture a kind of dramatic flight from marriage, a dramatic flight from childbearing and, you know, what we call kind of in, in East Asia kind of bare branches phenomena mm -hmm. where there are many people who are going to kind of go through middle age and, you know, uh, later life with no kin. And that's, I think, a very sobering you know, part of this, and it's not all bad news, we're going to have the good news too, but the bad news, I think, in large part is that, you know, family formation is way down and it's going to leave a lot of adults um, kind of living on their own, you know, economically, socially, and emotionally. Yeah, you know, believe me, I can relate to exactly what you're saying is that my wife and I, we have a, one son and you know, right now, no siblings, probably at our ages, there won't be one realistically. Could happen, but, um, you, you know, the odds are not good. And he has no first cousins. And I just think about that. I'm like, right. wow, we have, we have, in a sense, we have done that to him. He didn't ask for that. Uh, but that kind of goes to show you, uh, and most of my, uh, most of my first cousins on my mom's side of the family, we all have one kid. Almost all of us just have one kid. And so it's a little weird, you know, to to, to that. But uh, you know, I'm I'm very thankful that I even have one. Sure. But you know, it's interesting you, yeah. you say that. Um, um you know, the last studies that I've seen, people were saying a quarter of millennials would never get married, and you're saying that, and like Gen Z down is probably going to be even higher. Yeah. No, there's been some work done at the Urban Institute that puts the number at around thirty percent. And you know, my sense with the, with the sort of culture where it's at, I mean. Uh, and the economy where it's at, particularly for working class and poor Americans, that you know it's going to be north of thirty percent for Gen Z is is my concern. Yeah, well, you're right. We all, we see this in, in uh, East Asia a lot. I worked on a study with Joel Kotkin uh, right. about a decade ago uh, in Singapore on post familialism. He talked about yes. what Asia is a post familial right. society now, East Asia, and it, it's really insane when you look at the fertility rates in places like Shanghai. It's like whoa, like lowest in the world. But I do think there's a sometimes a misleading some misleading comparisons. You know, when I was growing up, I used to hear all these things like, you know, 
uh, when people were 14 back in the 19th century, they were considered adults and mm -hmm. they were getting married. And I don't think that's actually true. I mean, I, I think that, you know, like the, the ages of marriage in the 50s sure. were unusually young. So I, right. are we really, how out of true are we, both in terms of mm -hmm. average age of, of marriage and the percentage of people who never married? Because my understanding is a lot of people, like in the 19th century, a high percentage of people never right. married. So if we were going to go back, say, to mm -hmm. the late 19th century, right. late 1800s, how do these numbers compare, just to give like a, a you know, a sense? <laughs> Yeah, no, it, it's true, Aaron, that kind of the age at first marriage ebbs and flows. And, you know, in the 50s, 60s and early 70s, we had kind of historically low age at first marriage in this country. Um, and of course, in the 50s and 60s, we had high numbers of folks getting married. So, um, you know, if you kind of make the 50s your benchmark, um, almost kind of no matter what, you know, um, fertility and marriage are going to look kind of bad in the U.S. Um, and so they have ebbed, ebbed and flowed. But you know, I think what we're seeing, I mean, now is kind of a, a uniquely <laughs> um, sort of uh, low demographic pattern when it comes to both marriage and fertility. So there's no question that, you know, probably last year was the lowest fertility on record in, in American history. And, you know, marriage would be, I think, probably basically the same story as well. So it's not just sort of compared to the 1950s, which were kind of an exceptional decade, but it's sort of just across the broad scope of American history. We just, um, you know, haven't been in this place when it comes to both fertility and marriage. Um, and yeah, I wouldn't be, cons if the age of first marriage was, you know, 25, 26, 27, you know, no mm -hmm. big deal. But as it pushes, you know, past 30, um, that means that number one, a lot of people are gonna miss the mark. In terms of you know reaching their aspirations for for kids you know for even getting married um and then it also just means that you know our society isn't kind of i think kind of putting enough value on um marriage and family life as well um, not recognizing for instance that 20 somethings who are married tend to be doing a lot better when it comes to their emotional and social well-being compared to their peers um, who are not married. So there's, I think there's kind of all this, this sort of like this friends idea out there to take the show, the you know, friends. And people think like, you know, just sort of living on your own or with friends in your 20s is sort of the best way to do it. And yet the the data that I've seen tell a very different story. And that is the people who are married in their 20s are, you know, more satisfied, less depressed, less likely to abuse alcohol, you know, the whole nine yards. So it's, there's a sort of false idea out there that, you know, the 20 something years should be kind of these odyssey years. And then you kind of settle down in your late twenties and early thirties and, and everything, you know, is uh, better when done that way. But that, that's not what the research actually tells us. Yeah. You know, I, I you always read that, you know, uh, there, there's loneliness is like a big deal too. So there's, you would think that people would lean into their friendships Right. when they don't have family but actually everything i see is people are even more socially isolated from friends even well life. yeah i think the friendship ties you know um and dan cox at ai just came out with some recent you know uh, yeah. research on this suggesting a decline in friendship um although he didn't break it out by class and you know there was a kind of a discussion the last i think month about kind of you know men not having enough friends and a lot of people in my Twitter circles were very skeptical of that, you know, and they were saying, well, I've got plenty of friends, you know, people that I, that I sort of know vaguely through, you know, think tanks or through, um, you know, media or ac academia. Um, but, you know, what I didn't necessarily know or see is sort of how representative, you know, was their view. And, and I think based upon Dan Cox's more recent research, there belief that there are sort of plenty of, you know, young adults with strong friendship networks is not representative. And so I think, you know, if I had to hypothesize here, I would say that um, perhaps kind of the uh, erosion of friendship is even more concentrated among working class and poor Americans. Uh, but again, in general, we are seeing yeah, a decline in marriage and a decline in, in people's uh, reports of friendship. And that's uh, deeply disturbing because when you look at kind of people's reports about meaning and their happiness in life um, and their emotional and physical well-being, you know, in later life, there's no question that strong family ties and strong friendship ties 
are more important than the degree on your wall or the amount of money in your bank account. Yeah, I think public intellectuals are especially unrepresentative of the world. You know, because I'm a writer, like a public writer, I have right. such a vast network of people who know who I am. I can go to any city and just tweet out. I know it because I've done it. I just tweet out, hey, I'm in this city. I'm going to be in this city. People right. start picking me, hey, let's get together. Let's get together. Uh, right. But before I started, you know, blogging back in the, in the mid 2000s, if it, was, if it were just me it, without right. this sort of public intellectual network, I would know a lot fewer people. I mean, see, you get an artificial boost. There's almost like a celebrity boost you get from being an academic. You know, you're not obviously you're not a Hollywood actor, right? But you're you're an academic. You're at conferences. You you're out there on right. Twitter. You're in the media. You run into a lot of people, and that that's the most unrepresentative group of all time. Yeah, Aaron. So I think that's right. I think a lot of people, journalists, um, think tankers, academics, um, especially when they're kind of weighing in on topics outside of their lane, you know, often are saying things that are not at all representative of what's happening for ordinary Americans. Right. So I got uh, I got one question from the audience. See if you know the answer is um, uh, from Greg. What percentage of white women in the U.S. are marriage and what percentage of black women in the United, in the United States? I guess kind of the racial at, you know decomposition of some of these trends, I guess, is what he's getting at. Yes, we have um, obviously really since um, the. Um, the 1950s, um, you know, and even early 60s, um, it's important for us just to kind of begin to answer that question by just sort of acknowledging that there were not um, big, you know, racial differences in marriage. There were not big class differences in marriage, you know. And so only kind of since the 1960s have we seen not only a decline in marriage, but also kind of a dramatic increase in um, sort of the number of um, or so dramatic increase in sort of the, the gap, the racial gap when it comes to marriage. So um, for instance, when we're looking at kind of um, the share of, of black and white women um, who are married in um, kind of sort of the 15 and older, um, you know, bracket we see is that about 28% of black women um, are married um, compared to about 50 uh, about 53% of, um, of white women who are married. And this is in around 2011, 2012. So, you know, a pretty dramatic difference in, um, you know, the share married. And if you were to go back to say 1960, um, there was, you know, there was a gap, but it was much smaller and, and a clear majority of both black and white women were married in 1960. Yeah, and the same thing is true on class. There have been these massive divergences, you know, within our society. It's kind of it's kind of crazy. I yeah. So j just in kind of in, in straightforward terms, what we see in the um, in the class story there as well is that a clear majority of college educated Americans will get married and will stay married. Um, and by contrast, only a minority of um, Americans who don't have that college degree. Um, will both marry and, and stay married, be stably married across the course of their adult life. So uh, that's also a major, and, and in fact, you know, we've got some research coming out soon, I think with Nicholas Zill here at IFS indicating that when it comes to sort of family structure, it may be the case now that education is a stronger predictor than race, which would, mm -hmm. I think would be, would be kind of emblematic of the sort of class story here uh, that's so important in, in Marriage Day America. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to take a little d detour and just ask about how you kind of got to where you're, you're studying this. So where did you grow up? So, yeah, I grew up in Connecticut. I was raised by a single mom in Connecticut and in the 70s, kind of at the height of the divorce revolution. Uh, actually, most of my my friends um, growing up in Connecticut um, had parents who uh, were divorced or ended up getting divorced um, by the time I hit young adulthood. So that was sort of my uh, I was exposed to a lot of, you know, single parent family instability in a pretty middle class context in Connecticut, um, but went to UVA and um, at the University of Virginia kind of came to the view uh, that fatherhood was sort of best supported by uh, marriage, that kind of marriage, the institution that kind of connected men to uh, their kids across the life course. And that, you know, insight 
propelled me into uh, an academic career in sociology. I, I was studying politics at UVA as an undergraduate, but then I went to Princeton um, to study sociology as a graduate student mm -hmm. and got a PhD focusing on religion and family life in America. Um, but my sort of interest in all this was sort of based in part upon my own experience being raised in a single parent family. And then the sort of, you know, I think insight that I had as a, you know, as a UVA undergraduate that sort of marriage was an institution that really uh, connected men to their kids. Right. So are, are you Generation X? In I'm Generation X. So yeah, I was born in 1970, right at yeah. the beginning of the divorce, you know, yeah. revolution. My parents were divorced in 1974. I think, again, it was the same thing. The first generation of children of the no fault divorce revolution. Right. And I think as a result, Generation X people see the marriage question much differently than the boomers did. And yeah, yeah. And there were a lot of lies that were kind of told back then you know, right. about it, too. It's like they sort of like told themselves some happy stories. And it was only um, later, you know, that that some of the truth started to actually come out as we saw the results. Yeah, there was a striking article in The New York Times uh, a number of years ago, kind of on how divorce lost its uh, cachet. And it was chronicling how sort of, you know, married mothers um, in Park Slope and in Seattle were kind of taking marriage more seriously. And uh, there was sort of a striking quote from the writer in, in Seattle, I think Claire Detterher is her name, talking about how she wanted to kind of, you know, her, how her mother kind of in the 60s and 70s had, had kind of had this very, um, well, kind of, you know, uh, very typically countercultural lifestyle and divorced her dad and all this kind of stuff. And how she wanted to go in a very different direction um, and to sort of, you know, give her kids organic milk and remain stably married. Now, Claire is very progressive if you kind of follow her on Twitter and, and whatnot. But I think her kind of her view about the importance of civil marriage and she's and she's stably married with kids today is emblematic of how, you know, I think many Gen Xers, you know, wanted to sort of approach marriage in a much more serious way than did their own parents. Yeah, it's certainly not seen as just a casual thing. And that's that's for sure. And, and not, especially now no. that like child rearing is so competitive now. I think about like, you know, when I was a kid, you just sort of applied to colleges. Well, now it's like a military operation from before you, the kids even conceived to think about how you're going to get them into like a good school. And, and so things, you know, I think people just approach things with a little more, maybe a little more seriousness now than they used to back when it was sort of just, you know, th throw your kids to the institutions, you know, and or kick them out of the house. And there's some good that came out of that. I guess as well that being you know being able to have the, we're the last generations that probably got to go outside and play, you know, but there are also some negatives to it. I think this cavalier attitude towards divorce is one of them. Yeah, so I think you know on the one hand there was a kind of a lot, a lot of us were latchkey kids, you know, in our teenage years, and we had a certain kind of freedom to move in and out of the household. But parents might not be in the household, and that's obviously different the way you know compared to the way a lot of our kids are raised today. Um, and I don't think kind of that latchkey sort of thing is necessarily a bad thing if you kind of have the security of knowing your parents are, you know, generally, you know, there in the household and you know the neighbors and that kind of thing. Um, and of course, the challenge in the 70s and 80s was that a lot of kids, um, you know, had a household where, you know, a parent was disappearing on them. And often there was a, you know, a boyfriend or a new parent kind of moving in, you know, and, and that created new complications. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, when I think back about my childhood and like what's changed uh, since the kind of rural upbringing I had in the 70s and 80s, um, you know, I think about even though, you know, there was divorce and there were the you know, occasional out of wedlock births, the culture and context of that community was heavily shaped by yet predominantly intact families. You know, so uh, for example, you know, my, my, grandparents on both sides of my family were married for their whole lives. Right. So, and, you know, many of my aunts and uncles, stable marriages, that's, that's what was around. So, you know, a few people get divorced, there's all this stuff around it. Now, if you go down there, it's much more likely that the grandparents were divorced or never married and are really, so it's kind of, um, you get this multi-generational family breakdown. Right. And we've seen, you know, classically from inner cities, 
Well, that's the exact same pattern we see in, in rural America today, not healthy. Right. And as, as you know, Aaron, I think what we really see is that, you know, family breakdown begins in some ways in the, in the, you know, in the late 60s and 70s um, with more divorce, and more single parenthood hits poor and, and black communities, you know, sort of first. Um, and then in the 80s and 90s really hits working class and white communities very hard as well. And that's the kind of pattern you're talking about. Yeah. And again, it's it's one thing for your own parents to get divorced and yet to have grandparents who kind of have both the capacity to give you support, but also kind of model for you what a good marriage looks like. But now we're seeing, you know, multi-generational family instability play out across many working class communities. And that's, you know, it's obviously devastating. Yeah, I mean, I, I look, I see there's like a lot of the families where I come from, there's like one generation left, maybe a few of the baby boomers who didn't get divorced Right. Who are like now grandparents, still stable. And I kind of think, man, when they're when they pass on, it's going to be look out below in some of these <clears throat> situations. Yeah, although I think, you know, it's I think we're kind of at the point where at least for, <coughs> you know, for some Americans, we've kind of hit bottom and, you know, people are kind of looking around for new models, you know, new communities that will kind of help them rebuild a life centered around marriage and family in part, um, as well as community, you know, recognizing that, you know, a lot of the models that have played out in our culture since the sixties have kind of hit a dead end. So mm -hmm. uh, that's, and it's just, I think more, and you, I think probably have seen this as well. It's, it's sort of more at the anecdotal level right now. Um, but I'm certainly seeing, you know, communities now where, um, there are kind of many more married families with a bunch of kids, you know, than was the case, say, even 15 years ago, you know, so. Mm. Well, I know some of the things like the out like birth rate seem to have kind of plateaued and, you know, like some of the things like the teen pregnancy went down. So these things aren't fated to just go one direction. Right. You know, forever, just like marriage, things bounce around and there's a danger and there's a danger in just straightforwardly extrapolating everything. Yeah. And so we do see, so I told you about the, the bad news when it comes to the state of our unions is really about adults. You know, a large minority of adults in America will probably end up um, kinless, you know, without without a spouse, without children. The good news, though, is that the folks who are getting married and having kids today are much more likely to be stably married. You know, most of the time they're reasonably happy. Of course, there are always, you know, days and chapters in their marriages when things aren't so good. But um, you know, so the good news is that the the marriages that are being formed today and the families that are being formed today with kids, um, they're trending up in terms of, of family stability. And they're also ones where if you kind of if you survey, you know, married husbands and wives, you know, on, a, you know, on a regular basis, what you see is that you know, about two thirds of them would say that they're very happy and, and, and any given day with their marriage. So those are two, I think, you know, pieces of good news that um, should give some encouragement to folks who are thinking about marriage, for instance. What are some of the forces or factors that have driven this, you know, marriage decline, birth rate decline in the country, in, in your view? Yeah, so I think when it comes to sort of thinking about why marriage has, um, has retreated so dramatically since the 1970s, I think that there are, you know, three kind of big patterns here to, to be thinking about. Um, one is the way in which our economy has uh, not um, done well by uh, men who don't have college degrees. So they've seen their incomes be fairly stagnant. Um, we've seen increases in unemployment, underemployment. We've seen increases too in the share of these guys who are not even in the labor force. Um, and even today in 2021, it's still the case that um, women are looking for guys who have a decent income, a stable job. So if there are fewer of those guys in the picture, there's going to be less marriage. So that's, that's the economic point. I think the political point here or the policy point here is that uh, family law, you know, since the 70s has been, you know, less marriage friendly. And I'm not saying we should go back to no, sorry, default based divorce. And you know, that was its own problem. But I think we have to recognize that, you know, 
probably some kind of divorce law reform would be helpful in addressing the way in which our family law currently doesn't do much to, you know, to support marriage. But even more, I think, importantly than that point is the way in which um, our means tested policies like Medicaid, for instance, their income tax credit um, end up penalizing marriage for millions of working class couples with kids across America. So I, I was speaking, for instance, to a couple here in Virginia um, with two beautiful little daughters. And, you know, they've been together for a while, probably like, I don't know, six years or so, seven years. And they weren't married. I was kind of trying to figure out what's going on there. And they said, well, we actually sat down at the kitchen table and we calculated how, how we'd be affected in terms of Medicaid because he didn't have health insurance at his job. And so they realized that if they, you know, if they got married, reported their, you know, their income to, um, to the state, they would lose access to Medicaid. So that's sort of the state and our public policies more generally are penalizing marriage among working class, um, you know, families in ways that I think are, are, um, are uh, profoundly unhelpful. Yeah, I, um, well, and you're, then, you're, I, w I just want to interrupt for a second because you know I have a family uh, member. I'll just leave it at that. Who's the exact same thing? She's got multiple kids with this guy she lives with, and they they are very aware. Low income people who uh, qualify for government benefits are very aware of those programs and how they work. I mean, they know it inside and out, and they're like, "No, we're not getting married. That would be stupid." Basically, it was a very strategic, conscious and strategic decision. Right. And this is not true for obviously everyone, but it's just it's it, we, it, I think it's kind of insane that we would have a, you know, a policy regime where, you know, we're making it a financially, you know, bad decision to go ahead and put a ring on it. I mean, mm -hmm. marriage is a crucial institution and it's insane that the state would make marriage, uh, you know, financially disadvantageous for so many working class couples. Uh, today in America and historically many lower income couples more broadly. So that's that's the second thing I'd say. And then the, the third point is just that, you know, culturally, we've kind of moved from a, a roughly familistic, you know, orientation where we kind of understand and appreciate marriage. We understand and appreciate, you know, the duties that spouses have towards one another, the duties that parents have towards their children, the duties that adult children have towards their older parents to a much more individualistic culture um, where it's much more about you know, doing what makes you feel good, what makes you happy, what you desire. Um, and of course, what people don't realize is that not only does that kind of reduce the impetus to get married and to stay married, um, it also, I think, uh, blocks off uh, many people from kind of, you know, um, realizing the things that give us the most meaning, purpose, and happiness. And that is, you know, again, family and friends. Um, and so, you know, it's these relationships that have some degree of friction. Any good friendship is going to have, you know, points where you're not happy with that person. They, you know, they anger you, disappoint you, et cetera. And the same thing true is for, you know, is for marriage and family life as well. But at the end of the day, you know, we're, as Aristotle said, we're social animals. And unfortunately, our society has tended in the last 50 years to, um, you know, upsell individualism and to downsell familism. And, um, you know, a lot of people have bought that, you know, that myth that the thing that will make them happy is um, pursuing their own desires rather than being, you know, a good husband, good wife, good father, good mother, and a good friend. You're sort of getting at this a little bit, um, but like, what, what's the so what? So we've had a decline in marriage, we've yeah. had a decline in kids. So, yeah, so, the so, so what is, so yeah, the, kind of so what, you know, right. The so what is, uh, I mean, it really doesn't matter. I mean, I, so I'm, I'm writing a book on marriage right now, Aaron, and, you know, um, economically, you know, people and, you know, as they head in towards retirement have like, you know, three times the assets if they're married, um, compared to their single and, you know, never married and divorced peers. Um, you know, they're much less lonely on average. They're much happier on average. Um, they um, they have regular opportunities to to care for others and to receive care. And I think a lot of people, especially a lot of men, don't appreciate how much better we do when we are um, enmeshed in relationships that are are constituted by caregiving. You know, and so kind of being in a strong friendship network, being in a, you know, a strong family 
is just so much better for us than living on our own, doing things on our own terms. So that's that's part of the story as well. Um, I think it's also the case too, Aaron, that um, my, my, my hypothesis here with this book is that marriage doesn't just matter. It matters more than ever for men, women, especially kids. And I think that's the potentially the case, right? Because on the one hand, I think the social world is becoming more and more tumultuous. You know, the sort of the times are more and more tumultuous. You know, we're talking about recurring recessions. We're talking about <laughs> pandemics, potentially. We're talking about less social trust, more political polarization, you know? And so who, who are you gonna turn to in this world we live in? Well, I think you have to be, I think, more likely to appreciate how much your family might matter even more today for you than it did say 40 or 50 years ago in a more high trust, um, stronger community context. So that's, that's, I think also part of the story. And just to kind of give you an example of what I'm talking about, um, we have uh, some research that Wendy Wang and I are doing in IFS uh, looking at kids graduating from college and kids making the middle class or higher as um, as adults. And what we find is that um, more recent generations benefit even more from family stability than was the case for um, uh, for um, uh, for Gen Xers. And so the point I'm making here simply is that it looks like having the benefit of stably married parents matters more for educational attainment and for economic advancement for today's young adults than it did, you know, 25 uh, or 30 years ago. And that's probably, it makes sense too, because dads now, when they're in the household, are more involved with their kids. And so kids today who are being raised in married, stable families have, I think, an even greater advantage um, compared to kids who are being raised in stable married families say in the seventies when I was coming up because um, dads uh, are that much more engaged. So uh, anyways, I could talk more about it, but the, the bottom line is that there's no question that men, women, and, and especially kids um, who are being raised in married families and communities that have a lot of married families, you know, anchoring those communities are doing better on almost every sociological measure that we can look at. You mentioned family law in about, uh, you know, four or five years ago, you did this Prager University video. Um, I assume it's still out there talking about, you know, why men should, should get married. And you got attacked by some of these online guys right. who are part of the men going right. their own way movement, MGTOW, this right. guy, turd flinging monkey, uh, who's since been banned. They pretty much banned all the MGTOW people. So, but some of their videos, like this guy had like video after video after video, basically saying, don't get married. It's the dumbest decision you can ever make in your life if you're a guy. If you get married, you know, your wife can divorce you. Right. She'll take all your money. Your child support, you're going to get, you know, raked over the coals. Look at all these things. Right. And, oh, you know, it's like you earn more money. That's because you got this ball and chain around your leg. You know, it's not helping you any. It's not helping right. you to earn more money. It's all going to them. You're just a chump to get married. So right. what do you think of the these guys who are really – it's rare, like, I, I think it's like a new thing to see there's a group of people basically out there saying, explicitly advocating, do right. not get married. It's a dumb idea, guys. Yeah, no, it was striking to me. I mean, normally I've been attacked from the left, mm -hmm. um, usually from, you know, feminist progressives when I talk about the, the merits of marriage. Um, but when I did that PragerU video, I was attacked from the sort of right, if you will, from the, um, the men's group kind of uh, segment of our population. And yeah, they think that marriage is a ball and chain, and that you know it's a, it's a bad deal, particularly because women can can divorce um, and leave with a substantial share of you know the family's economic resources, and with you know often sort of primary custody, at least in effect. So um, I think that there are there's certainly merits to the critique. You know, um, I think that. Some men are taken to the cleaners in in the situation. You know, they've been decent husbands, and you know something happens with their wife, and she leaves, and they're left sort of high and dry. And women um, file almost all the divorces. Well, it's about two thirds of divorces, yeah. so they they file for a majority of divorces. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so that's really happens. Uh, but I think what they don't appreciate is that because of declines in divorce since 1980 in this country. We're back at about 19, probably 1969 levels of divorce. Um, 
you know, and a clear majority of marriages are going to go the distance. And moreover, you know, I would say, you know, there are things that if you do, you're much less likely to get divorced. So going to church as a couple reduces your risk of divorce markedly. Um, being stably employed as a man reduces your risk of divorce, you know, dramatically. Um, sharing a, a view of marriage is kind of a permanent commitment, you know, till death do us part, you know, on the front end, you know, finding a, a partner who believes that that's the case um, reduces your risk of divorce greatly. Um, and going on a regular date night looks like it reduces divorce. I'm just saying there are things out there too we can kind of tell men um, that if you work with your, you know, your wife to do these kinds of things, you know, um, both before you get married and then while you are married, um, your risks or your risk of getting uh, divorced are markedly lower. And kind of to give men some encouragement about um, the uh, the value of marriage and um, and the possibility of succeeding. Because again, men who are stably married are doing much better socially, emotionally, financially, on average, than their peers who are not stably married. And so, you know, it's important for us to communicate that truth to uh, to men who, again, often see marriage as a ball and chain. Yeah, you know, I always say uh, that you have to play money ball for marriage. And you know, there are all these, there actually are plenty of actually online divorce risk calculators. And I'd say it, but you kind of do have to put a prospective spouse through the statistical tools to say, given the characteristics of this person, right. for example, are her parents divorced? Like that is a risk factor for her getting divorced. Yes. You gotta, you gotta look at that because it is something that's, um, that's right. there. And, and, and so I think, you know, if you're a man, you gotta go in kind of with your eyes open today. Uh, but you know, I think if you look at it, it is eminently possible statistically to get into a marriage with a fairly low statistical probability of divorce. You know, if, you, right. if you're looking at some of these factors yep. and actively, you know, feel, you know, paying attention to who you marry and then engaging in some of these practices. Yeah, no, exactly. I think, you know, I've mentioned a bunch of things. The other thing that I would say, of course, is just sort of the importance of friendship and, um, you know, finding someone where you have a, pr a profound um, kind of meeting of the minds on the most important things. So that could be religion, could be politics, could be, you know, whatever your ultimate values are. Um, and then also where you have some things you like to do together, um, like that, you know, will form the basis of a strong friendship when that initial romantic and erotic um, connection begins to, um, it doesn't disappear, but it just becomes obviously, the, the, the butterflies, you know, in marriage go away at some point, right? Isn't it like um, a two year, the honeymoon phase last two years? It's like a chemical it, thing. It obviously depends on the couple, it, it, you know, but for most people, obviously, that strong erotic and romantic, you know, um, you know, passionate connection is, is, is going to, is going to go away to some extent. And so number one, you've got to try to keep cultivating it. Um, that's why things like dating are helpful. Uh, but secondly, you also have to, you know, really cultivate a strong friendship. And I think one of the things that I've seen as someone who's now middle age is that the friends I've had who've gotten divorced, you know, and married early in their twenties, uh, often really didn't have much in common. I mean, there was obviously a kind of a strong romantic or, you know, or sexual connection there. Um, but there wasn't a series of commitments, uh, a series of hobbies, sports, you know, whatever it might be, you know, um, that kind of brought them together as friends. And so I think that when, you know, things got tough, uh, their marriages uh, collapsed. Mm -hmm. So what do you think is going to happen to this, you know, say, a quarter to a third of the people are never going to get married. How do you see that playing out over time? Because I, I can already see the consequences of later marriage. For example, my wife and I have one kid. Yeah. And we would probably have both said, how many, what would be the ideal number of kids to have? We'd say three. Well, that's yes. almost certainly not going to happen. And that's a consequence. I always say, don't live life the way I lived it. Right. Uh, you know, and, right. you know don't, don't do what I did. Uh, but what's going to happen, you know, I think about that, like, okay, great. I missed my boat on having the kids that I wanted, but I was able to have one kid in part because I'm a guy <laughs> and say, so I could have kids later than, sure. than women who you know, have a smaller biological fertility window. How's this going to play out for people over time? Do you think? 
Yeah, no, I think right now it's a pretty sobering, you know, pattern, right? So it means people are going to have fewer kids. There'll be fewer cousins, like you just mentioned earlier in the conversation. Um, and I think bare branches, again, this is the term from really China, actually, for um, actually men who don't have any kin, um, you know, often don't do very well on any number of dimensions. And I think certainly also are kind of um, likely, you know, there's people, you know, younger people who are not married, have no kids, are more likely to get in trouble, guys, obviously, especially. And I think, too, there's also a way in which people who don't have um, family ties are also more likely to be uh, prone to a kind of radicalism. It can be on the left or the right as well. So the worry here is that we'll have a large pool of American adults who are not anchored to a family. And uh, that's that can be a recipe for both political and um, and social unrest, disorder, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, um, I, you know, I, I'm not one of these people who's, you, you see a lot of people who've like got married young, had a bunch of kids, they're homeschooling the whole thing, and they're extolling family life. And I'm like, you, well, you, you've never experienced life as like a single adult, <laughs> adult so you don't, even, you don't know what you're missing. I feel like I had some experience as, right. you know, with a dual income, no kids, and like life's pretty good. And you give up a lot when you have a kid. Uh, I would argue you gain more. The best thing I ever heard about this was a quip. It's like having kids makes life 10 times harder and 100 times better. But when you're in that kind of mode, uh, you know, you're 30 and you're, you know, you're, you're having a great time. You're living large and loving a life. You know, you finally have some money. You're making it up in your career. You're going out on the town. What you give up is very tangible and experiential what you what you would gain by having kids is kind of ephemeral <laughs> you know you don't really it's kind of hard to relate to and so i i actually i see how people make make these choices and i think a lot of times like women do not understand really often that you know when they get to be late 30s into their 40s the amount of male attention that they will receive is going to collapse and you know it's it's really like shocking that i hear from some women say like i, I haven't been at and, no guys ever ask me out on dates now. I'm like, what? How's that possible? You were the, you know, you were so popular. But so I think it's like a lot of things we don't realize, just like me with having one kid, mm -hmm. you don't realize the right. reality of the decisions you were making until it's too late to do anything about them. And I think that's really yeah, a that's, challenging situation. That's really the challenging point. Right. So, and this is where I think a lot of 20 somethings, you know, they don't realize that, um, you know, in terms of finding a spouse and having the number of kids that they want to have, you know, time matters. And um, so, yeah, it's great to invest in your career. It's, you know, great to enjoy, um, you know, some good restaurants and travel, all that kind of stuff. But, you know, the more you invest in work and um, travel and consumption, um, the less you're going to be able to invest in 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 family life i think for you know for many of us and so um you there's a short-term gain long-term pain you know situation for a lot of adults today where they're focusing on things that kind of give um you know pleasure meaning and purpose in in the short term but may leave them high and dry when they're in their 30s and beyond mm. Yeah. And yeah, in terms of the, I think one thing too, it's important to know, there's been a lot of like stuff in the media and among my colleagues in academia kind of um, sort of talking about how hard it is to be a parent and, and what, a, you know, um, you know, how tough it is to be a parent and all this kind of stuff and sort of implying it's sort of misery inducing. Um, but what a lot of people don't realize is, yeah, yeah as you put out, it's, it can be really tough, um, especially with little kids in some ways. Um, kind of on a day in and day out basis. But today, American parents are actually happier than non-parents, um, than childless Americans. Uh, now, it's not a, it's, it's a, it's a very small <laughs> difference on average, um, just on the happiness score. But it's just important to note that it's no longer the case that parents are less happy um, than, um, than um, the childless adults. And there's no question that parents report much more meaning in their lives um, than childless uh, folks. And then you kind of look beyond to middle age and, you know, your um, your later life. Um, you know, 
I visit a nursing home locally with with my kids. I've got a lot of kids, and I can assure you're you, you're buying your own product. I didn't get I didn't get to there. You, you bought your own yeah. product here. Well, so I, I can assure you, when I go to a nursing home with a big family, there are no <laughs> there are no negative comments at all. I mean, it's it's all you know. It's people are very happy, very excited to see my children. Um, and you realize that when you're when you're an older person, I, I think having you know a a bunch of kids, having a lot of grandchildren. You know, maybe even having great grandchildren is incredibly meaningful at that later. And so, you know, maybe you didn't get to go out on the town as much, you know, travel to the Caribbean as much, whatever. But I mean, when you're in your 70s and 80s, <laughs> having sacrificed for your spouse and your kids, I think can pay some huge dividends. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I think about that. What's, you know, what is going to happen um, as, um, we, we see aging, you know, I mean, I think about like how my parents took care of their parents when they got yeah, old. And, right. and yes, you know, so people had to go to a nursing homes. They had to be a bit like you've got somebody there like you're in the hospital. Um, you know, my, my grandmother's in the hospital and my mom is there like fighting with the medical staff to make sure she's getting getting the attention. Yep. All the stuff she's getting visited. She's getting all these things. And like what's going to happen is we have a lot more single childless people. Right. aging do, do you how do you see that right. playing out obviously it's somewhat speculative yeah. yeah no i think i mean my uh my in-laws you know i've been married more than 50 years and my father-in-law it's a serious medical issue in december and you know my mother-in-law was there like a <laughs> i mean a, you know she, a terrier she was just like at the hospital you know on the doctors on the nurses you know and so he had excellent care at the at uva hospital um, and also, you know, my wife was on the scene as well. And, you know, so he had the benefit of having kind of that family advocate right there on scene and, 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 and has come out and done, done really well. But he, if he hadn't had, you know, that family support, I'm not sure how things would have turned out. Um, and then, you know, you visit nursing homes, you know, and there are plenty of folks who just don't, no one comes and visits, you know? Um, so there are going to be a lot of, people in the coming decades who are going to be facing major um, problems when they're in the hospital or when they're in a retirement community or nursing home um, and there's no one there for them. There's no one really, no one there to be in their corner. Um, and they're going to have to rely on, on people who they're just paying um, who may not really care much for them, you know, in, in yeah. their last chapter. Yeah, it's uh, it's really uh, it's kind of strange. I was just an article. It may have been in the Times in the last couple of weeks. Uh, it was maybe in the style section. It was one of these things like you know, uh, I just put my boyfriend down as my emergency contact. It's like who do I put as my emergency contact? Right. Actually, it was this woman who was a China, an immigrant from China, so she didn't have a lot of family here. And I thought about that. Something as simple as who do you put as your emergency contact? It's like oh my goodness, right? Who's your next of kin? If you're unconscious in the hospital and somebody needs to make a medical decision, I guess they got to go find a guardian, like a public guardian. I don't know how it works, right. but it's like, I, it's like weird. Yeah. And although I think, you know, one of the sort of maybe, and we don't really know what the story here is yet, but I think one possibility is that the lockdowns from, you know, the COVID, um, you know, pandemic uh, may have made some 20 somethings and 30 somethings, I think, more interested in getting married. You know, recognizing that, again, um, not that marriage is perfect, not that our spouses are perfect, that we're perfect, but that it's it sure is great to have someone in your corner, um, particularly when, you know, when the going gets tough. And so I think COVID may have made more young adults today kind of more marriage uh, marriage focused. And we'll, we'll see in the next, you know, two years. I mean, there is obviously an uptick right now in marriage because people had postponed marriages from last year. But you know, beyond sort of this year, we may see a, a bit of a, a boomlet in, in marriage if people kind of have been motivated by the lockdowns to pursue marriage in a more in intense way. Well, we know we saw kind of a real estate boom, so maybe we'll, maybe we'll see a, you know, a marriage boom. Yeah, it's, it's, I think it's a possibility. Yeah, you know, I, another one that I, I saw, I can't remember where I saw this, but it was, uh, I think it's a documentary somebody did about the villages in Florida, it's this uh, boomer kind of retirement community. It's like this gigantic, it's essentially a, a gigantic retirement community. 
and I, I guess, you know, there are all these kind of like senior living places where I guess today a lot of people go and they retire to Florida or Arizona. They don't necessarily have family around, but they've got this very structured environment with lots of activities and you create lots of friends because you're all there. And, you know, presumably, um, you know, younger generations aren't going to want to live exactly that way, but the market will come up with something, <laughs> you know, that will, that will be for, you know, single, you know, older adults to, to, to try to stay, you know, well, engaged. I think that's true. I think retirement communities are getting in some ways better about offering, you know, their members communities. But uh, I've also seen reports in in the media of an increase in multi-generational homes where you have, you know, grandparents, parents, and kids, um, living in the same household. And, um, you know, so for instance, uh, there was a national survey done um, last year that found that 15% of home buyers were seeking to buy multi generational homes. And that was up um, from 11% in, in the previous years um, or the previous year. Um, so, this I think is an encouraging development because, you know, um, I think it's you know, I think speaking personally, I think I think grandkids like having more time with grandparents. And I think that although there can be frictions between the, you know, the generations, obviously, it's also the case, too, that it's much easier to deal with the tasks of juggling work and family and caring for young kids if you've got grandparents involved on a regular basis. And of course, multi-generational housing is the, <laughs> it's the premier way to do that, you know? Yeah. So that, that's an encouraging development, I think, for me too. And certainly I, I hope when I'm retired, I hope to live with or close to, you know, my own, my own children, because I, I don't want to live in a, in a nursing home, nor do I want to live in a retirement community, you know, if I don't have to. So. Yeah. I think it's going to be interesting at, you know, having baby boomer parents move in with generation X people. I think it's a little, it's a little different. Maybe I, mm -hmm. I've already heard a few negative stories of people whose parents moved in with them when they got older. So we'll, we'll see how that one goes. But I, I you know, I do sure. think you're right. There's going to be more of that. I would certainly rather have my parents living with me than being in a nursing home. Uh, you know, if I could, you mm -hmm. know, if I, if I could avoid it and, uh, you know, so it's, um, you know, I, I, I definitely think that's possible. Now, I don't know exactly what your time situation is here, but there's at least one topic I'd like to to cover. Sure. And that, that I think is just indisputable when it comes to kids. And we've talked about this a little bit. And it is, uh, excuse me, to marriage. It's so much better for children to be raised in an intact home. I mean, it, the statistics are insane on every, essentially every social pathology in America correlates overwhelmingly with fatherless homes, broken homes. Raj Chetty at Harvard, the economist who did all this, got all this, you know, proprietary IRS data, found that like the number one correlate of poor uh, upward economic mobility in a neighborhood was the share of single mothers. I mean, we just get into this, this broken home environment. And yet, yeah, I just saw you on Twitter. There's this thing on Twitter. It's this, um, you know, this New York Times op-ed, they're always repping, hey, I, you know, I'm a single mom, I think my kids are great, I'm great, everything's great, but it's not great. What, what are some of the things that happen when children are raised outside of an impact home? Yeah, Aaron, it's a great question. So, um, you know, I think the tragedy, Aaron, is that um, we have seen um, in recent years, I think a new um, uptick in the number of scholars and journalists who are kind of publicly um, promoting what I call a kind of the family diversity theory. Um, and this is the idea that it's not the structure of your family that matters. It's sort of, it's the love and money, you know, in your family that matters. Philip Cohen at Maryland is an example. He kind of takes this line. There was an Atlantic article, for instance, and they featured a sociologist uh, from Indiana, actually your home state, Pamela Broadway Jackson, and she said this, she said, all of our research points to the fact that it's the quality of the relationships that matters and the handling of communication and conflict and the number of people in the household is not really the key. Okay, so again, the family diversity theory is that family structure doesn't matter. All family forms are kind of equally valid. It's just sort of the love and the money in the family that matter. Right. 
Now, the problem with this perspective is, <laughs> to be blunt, is it's false. It's a myth. It's not true. It's not true. That's, that's the problem. Um, what we see in our recent work that we did just last month is that, um, you know, young adults who've been raised uh, outside of intact married family are about twice as likely to land in prison or in jail um, by the time they hit about age 30. Um, we see that, you know, they're about three times as likely to experience child poverty and they're about, you know, um, 40 to 60 percent less likely to graduate um, from college. So just to kind of give you two more sort of um, concrete sets of statistics, you know, on this score. So what we see is that for millennials um, today, young adults today, 77% uh, of them have reached the middle class or higher if they're raised in intact family compared to just 57% for those in a non-intact family. So 20 percentage point difference, that's a big difference. And then when it comes to college graduation, even bigger statistics. Um, so 40% of millennials who are raised in intact family graduated from college compared to just 17% from non-intact family. It's just a huge divide, you know? So the point simply is that, you know, it's not true that all family forms are equally valuable for kids. And what I think is also not sort of, you know, acknowledged by especially the left on this particular uh, issue is that love and money <laughs> are more likely to be found in intact married families than they are in other family forms. And so, you know, one of the things that scholars often will do is they'll, they'll control for the financial resources of a family and then say, well, you know, family structure is not that important. Well, that's, you know, that's ridiculous. It's sort of like saying that poverty doesn't matter for kids. You know, once you can, once you control for neighborhood, you know, safety, school quality, you know, et cetera, et cetera. It's like, Stable families um, generate more income and more assets, you know, for the adults and kids in those families. And that's part and parcel of why they tend to benefit kids uh, more than other family forms. Yeah. And, you know, I, one of the questions that I've always had is you always see these claims. And I don't know if it's it's true. Maybe you shed a light on it. That a lot of the statistics are actually inflated for the number of kids living in intact families because the surveys really only pick up whether they're living in a two-parent home, even if that's a step-parent. And sure. so we don't necessarily know who's living with their own parents. Is that true or is that? Yeah, well, it's, so um, it, it is true that um, when you look at like two-parent families, you know, you are capturing some step-families. Um, although because, as I said before, um, we are kind of living in a world where marriage is actually more stable you know, that means that today more and more kids are being raised in stably married families. Now, it's not like, you know, it's, it's not 90 percent. Obviously, we're talking right now, you know, about um, about two thirds of um, kids are living with their own two biological parents. And of course, by the time they hit 18, that number will be lower for them. But again, we have seen an uptick in the share of kids living with their two biological parents. And that's because, in large part, marriage is much more stable than it used to be. Yeah, I mean, I ask that in part because the one statistic, and I think you've written about this, which it just always blows my mind, is incidences of child abuse in people living with their in intact biological parents versus single parent yeah. versus step parent. It's like, I mean, you could be it's like ten x or more instances of child abuse in these other family types. It's just like, I'm in my mind. And I, I see this because, sure. um, you know, you always turn on the news and it's like, yeah, the, the mother's boyfriend beats the kid mm -hmm. to death sure. or something like that. It's like, oh my gosh, sure. how often is it that it's not actually the family oh. member who does it, but it's some boyfriend or something like that. And it, it what is the actual stats on that? Yeah, so I would say kind of two things about this. Um, you know, on the one hand, the vast majority of kids are not abused and neglected. And that's obviously, you know, that's great news. And also just kind of more generally, I mean, you were raised, it sounds like in a single parent family, at least at some point I was raised in a single parent family. And, you know, most most kids who are raised in, you know, a single parent family, for instance, turn out okay. 
But it's also the case as a sociologist that, you know, I've got to say that your odds of experiencing poverty, experiencing abuse, experiencing depression, delinquency, all these kinds of things are certainly higher in uh, non-intact families. And so we do see in one federal report, for instance, that kids living with an unrelated male boyfriend, it looks like in the data, because it's an unrelated adult. So usually it's mom and, and, and the male boyfriend. We're about nine times more likely to be abused physically, sexually, or um, emotionally compared to kids being raised by their own married parents. So that was kind of a pretty striking pattern that we saw in this federal study. And it's sort of emblematic of sort of a broader pattern that we see in the research. And that is that kids um, who, you know, have experienced uh, family instability, single parenthood, especially an unrelated male in the household, are more vulnerable to uh, to this kind of thing. And you know, for instance, the the Christian rocker, I think his name is uh, it's NSF, is I think hmm. the um, I'm just looking this up here. Um, no, sorry, NF. Yeah, NF is um, has written kind of some pretty evocative um, stuff about how you know um, family instability was connected to him and his family um, with, with abuse as well. Yeah, I mean, so much throughout history, you think about Cinderella, right? There all these yeah. tropes of the, of the step-parent, the step-mother, the step-parents, how wicked they were to the kids. I mean, it just, and then you see these stats, you're like, yeah, I mean, there's something I think in the culture that people picked up that like step-parents are often not good for, uh, for the kids in question. Again, that doesn't mean all step-parents are bad, of course. But like certainly, you're much more yeah. likely to see, um, you know, you're much more likely to see these sorts of things happen in, in those, those homes. It's 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 incredible. It's and I think one, you know, one thing that's really I think worth, you know, um, sort of ending our, our conversation on here right now is that, um, again, the progressive imagination has this idea that embracing, you know, more family diversity is going to bring us into a progressive uh, sort of nirvana of sorts when it comes to family life. What they don't appreciate is that it's actually quite regressive. I mean, that is, it really kind of puts kids back. Um, and it's also kind of regressive in another way. And that is that it's fueling inequality, you know, economic inequality, social inequality in America, because what's happened is that in this world that we live in, it's poor working class families that are experiencing much more family instability and college educated American parents, as you know, Aaron, are generally figuring out ways to get married and stay married. And so as, as Ross Douthat has sort of pointed out in, in a kind of different language, sort of social liberalism as sort of as, as class warfare. And his point is that by embracing kind of these progressive family ideas, I think many elites unintentionally are creating a culture and a polity um, and even an economy today um, where kids in poor working class communities who experience much higher levels of family instability see their prospects for thriving, you know, socially, emotionally, and financially, um, you know, diminished um, because the communities are beset uh, by family instability. And for skeptics who, again, don't, who, who are not inclined to believe me or, or believe you on, on, this, uh, on this score, you know, all you have to do is, as you mentioned before, look at Raj Chetty's work on family instability and mobility for poor kids. It's no accident that Salt Lake City is one of the metro areas that has the highest rates of economic mobility for poor kids. Um, and Charlotte is one of those metro areas that has some of the lowest rates of mobility for poor kids. And that's because there are many more two-parent families in Salt Lake City um, area than there are in the Charlotte area. So again, as we kind of wrap up our conversation here, it's important to realize that in reality, uh, the sort of the traditional appreciation for marriage and family stability is rooted in an understanding of what's best for our kids and is in its own way, um, at least kind of viewed from the perspective of children and communities more generally, actually the best route towards social, emotional and economic progress uh, for people and communities that can um, develop a new and stronger appreciation for uh, the stable married family. Well, Brad, thanks a lot. This has been great. I really appreciate you taking the time to do it. Great stuff. Uh, Brad Wilcox, University of Virginia professor of sociology. Follow him on Twitter at Brad Wilcox IFS. Go to ifstudies.org 
uh, and check it out and read his books like Soulmate. So, Brad, again, thank you very much. Aaron, great to be with you. I appreciate the time today.